you for being here. Uh, this will be an informal town hall meeting. This is not a hearing. Um, and uh, we expect to, to hear from all of you uh, in, in order for the people that have signed up. Um, council had a lot of concerns in terms of the hiring practices and transparency of the administration with some of its recent hirings. Um, those uh, in particular with the, uh, uh, the position of Bland and Ace as, and I can't ever remember what it is exactly, Chief, Chief Opportunity Development Officer. Um, we, we've heard from constituents, many of you in this room and others that were unable to be here tonight, uh, and they've expressed concerns shared concerns, uh, and we take those concerns seriously. Uh, unlike the mayor who described these and characterized these as being silly the other day, uh, we do not think that it's silly. We are not planning to have any time constraints from the public, uh, but there's a room full of people here, many of whom want to speak, so uh, please curtail your remarks, be succinct, uh, and, uh, and if I find that, that you're being repetitive and not getting to the point, I'll point that out to you and we'll keep this thing moving so that everyone can be heard. Uh, those of you who have not filled out a form to speak, please do so and hand it in to me. Uh, the mayor is, will make some remarks <clears throat> to open up this meeting, and uh, then we'll proceed with, with questions. Um, council is pleased that the mayor has agreed to be here uh, to answer questions from the public and from council. And of course, we are interested, if you have any questions of council or any one of us as members, please feel free to do that um, from, from the podium. I'll now introduce Mayor Helfrich. Uh, thank you, Council President Nixon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Can you all hear me all right? OK, great. Uh, I wanted to just make one brief correction there. Um, I uh, described a letter comparing me to Charlie Robertson nine times as silly. Um, I don't, I'm not opposed to questions uh, at all. So I was actually referring to that letter that, uh, that uh, Com compared me to uh, Charlie Robertson and said something that I had done was similar to Charlie Robertson when we have no evidence that that is true. So, a um, little bit of our, about our economic and community development department. It's made up of community development, economic development, the Bureau of Health, and permits, planning, and zoning. So I was asked to share a few of the things that we are working on right now. The biggest thing that we are working on right now are the use of the federal opportunity zones. So federal opportunity zones are designated in low income areas across the country. We were able to get five of them desig designated here out of the 8,000 across the United States, which is a very high percentage. Um, that, what that means is that people that want to invest in low income communities, in bringing business, businesses, walkable jobs into those neighborhoods, get tax credit benefits from the federal government. The other thing that it means is that any kind of grants that we are applying to the federal government for, we get priority points. That means that, or preferential points, excuse me. That means that we go up to the, to the top of the stack if we are trying to work on housing grants, workforce development, educational grants, uh, Department of Justice grants. So it's very, very important that we utilize this opportunity zone designation. This is the best chance we've had for investment from the federal government in our city since they created community development block grants. This is big. So I'll get back to the reason, I mean, that is the reason why I created the community or the chief opportunity development officer. If that was a question, it is really about the opportunity zones that, that position works with opportunity zones, redevelopment authority, and other economic development strategies. That is what that position is all about and nothing more. 
So the next thing I want to talk about is our local sourcing initiative. This is being studied right now to determine how we can get or if we can get large businesses to set aside part of their contracts to invest in small businesses in our local income neighborhoods. This is based on a Philadelphia model. It's being studied by a local York City business, uh, the EMS group and York College and others. So they're working to see if we can find a way to invest in businesses in these low income neighborhoods to build up businesses. That is working with a new program that we are starting called the Neighborhood Microloan Program. Now you may have heard of microloans in India or Bangladesh or uh, in, in Africa, but why aren't we using them here? Well, they've recently started using them in Baltimore and other cities where if you have the support of the community, we set up a board that's made up of community members. Those community de members decide who has the credit, not a bank deciding who has the credit, but the community members decide who's trustworthy to get a loan. So for instance, if you have $5,000 worth of plumbing tools and you need a van, your neighbors decide whether or not to loan you 5,000 bucks for a van. So when you put the two together, the local sourcing initiative and the microloan program, we are actually able to invest capital in the low, low income neighborhoods. That is what we are all about. That is what we are working on right now. And we just brought in a partner, and actually I will say, Blanda just brought in a partner, a, a national banking firm that wants to work with us on this program. So th these are the things we're moving forward with in economic development. In community development, the Community Ecosystem Initiative has kicked off. It's in Salem Square. We have four individuals who are our community coordinators, and they are going out right now, business to business, church to church, uh, nonprofit group, service providers, and they're getting us all talking to each other and working to get programs available in the neighborhoods, not having to run all over the world to get different services, but bringing those services to the neighborhoods. As soon as they bring those all together, they will then be going out door to door to talk to people about what they specifically need and connecting them. If you need job training, you need prenatal care, you need, you need meals on wheels, whatever it is, we're going to be working together with you to get what you need in the neighborhoods. Our Bureau of Health, speaking of prenatal care, prenatal care is needed desperately in the city of York. We have about 800 babies born per year and only about 200 of them are getting the prenatal care at least from our, from Family First or from the Bureau of Health. So we're really adamant about getting that early help to the kids. As we know, by the time they're four, year, four, four years old, 60% of our young people are not making the benchmarks to go into kindergarten. We can't wait for the city school district to try and save our kids and, and get them to excellence. We've got to start at the very beginning to get them to excellence. In PP&Z, permits, planning, and zoning, we are working right now to bring the inspections back into the city of York. A uh, decision was made a while ago to outsource those. Uh, that decision uh, arguably uh, lost us some revenue. So far from our pilot program of bringing those inspections back in, we are bringing the revenue back and we've been able to hire new inspectors, bringing that oversight and that activity back into permits, planning, and zoning. So there's so much more. I've been given a limited amount of time, but I thank you for listening to that. We have handouts uh, about a lot more things that are going on in the economic development area. Um, we also have a public meeting at, here at City Hall and Council Chambers on July 24th at 6 p.m. to go more into the Community Ecosystem Initiative, to go more into the Group Violence Initiative, and also our Parks Program, which we've just received funding to redo the uh, Girard Park and the, uh, the kids' um, the playground equipment over there. Uh, we've, we're working on getting the lights back into Penn Park that have been out for years and it's been said it would cost a million dollars to get those back. We think we can do it a lot cheaper. Um, and also then we're gonna be working on Bance Park. So we're very excited about the park rollout. Um, and then, then economic development, we're waiting for this study to get back. The study's supposed to come back in August. I didn't wanna set the date yet, but I'm hoping to have a meeting on economic development in September. So we'll announce that later. Um, finally, um, 
I want to make this very clear before we even start. Philip Given is the acting director of economic and community development. He's in charge of 39 employees. He's in charge of the four different bureaus that I talked about. Landon Ace was hired as the chief opportunity development officer. He's in charge of one super awesome employee, Cherie McFadden. So he's in charge of one person. Philip's in charge of 39. That makes Philip the director. There should be no confusion about director. Did, Phil, did, did uh, Blanda get a decent salary? Yes, because he has 15 years of experience and he's who we need. Did other directors get a lot more in the past? Yes, Leonardo McClarty got $125,000. So yes, he's getting paid a good amount, but he's not a director and that's not a director's salary. So um, in closing, if you can't tell, I'm very excited about what we're doing. We are moving forward. We've got a lot of things on the horizon and I'm hoping everybody works with us because there is so much that we can do if we work together. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now we're gonna proceed with uh, public's comments. We have first uh, Ms. I'm never gonna pronounce this wrong, Jim Juski. We had hoped that uh, all the remarks would be limited to the subject uh, today, which is the economic development and hiring practices, but we'll, well certainly uh, allow you as a citizen of York. Thank you. Um, my name is Donna Majeski. Do you want me to uh, announce my address or anything first? Well, you're a York uh, resident? I am. I Thank am. you. Um, now, my first comment or question kind of falls in with the, uh, what Mayor Helfrich just said, that the, the um, I don't know how to put it, that the uh, development of low-income properties, is that correct? Is that going to be for low-income people? We are, we are certainly working on low-income housing right now. We have a development that's coming in out um, in, uh, on State Street at the old Dense Ply. Uh, we've got some other opportunities that we're looking at right now. So we are definitely working on that, yes. Thank you, that, that kind of answers my question. Uh, I also want to add that uh, as far as high rises go, that's, I don't know if everybody could hear me. As far as high rises go, that's fine and good, but there, I was hoping that there would be alternatives also for low income for high, uh, aside from high rises. Um, I am living in an apartment that I love. I was in a high rise for 15 years. I didn't like it there. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't qualify for Section 8. But if there were any way I could keep the current apartment, which is not in a high rise, I would. But like, I, I, and I tr I'll try to be brief. What I'm saying is that there are all these uh, higher end apartments going downtown, like within the four four blocks around the square. Now, uh, my thing is, why can't there be sliding incomes in those buildings? Because people who work are, sh are pushed out to the suburbs. They have to ride the bus, which is costly. They have to worry about getting on jobs on time. They have to, which could lose their job because the buses are not necessarily always reliable. So I'm saying, you know, uh, you know, and there's families that need housing too. I was in the Bell Family Shelter for three weeks two years ago, and I mean, I, I saw all kind, heard all kind of uh, stories and situations. And okay, I'll try and stop there, if I may. And my second comment was, and I know this this may or may not fall into the the topic tonight, but I'm a mental health consumer, a mental health patient. I live with schizoaffective disorder, and um, I've been doing well for over 10 years now, uh, with some bumps in the road. Um, my issue is that in case Nobody here, the, the city council members, the mayor, 
doesn't realize is that York Hospital is the only, only inpatient provider for acute care. Yes, we have the, uh, the other, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember, the long-term facility. But there are so many consumers, I'll just say mentally ill people like myself, there's not enough, not enough room in the York Hospital. The York Hospital's not necessarily the, the best provider. I mean, I've been in several hospitals around uh, eastern Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, including Philadelphia. Um, but uh, what I want to say is, um, is there any way that the Economic Alliance could work with MH Mental Health Intellectual Develop well, MHIDD in short, to, you know, promote or try to start building or think about setting up another either hospital or another clinic, uh, an inpatient place for mental health people that need it. Because that's, your hospital is the only show in town. And like, uh, I know from being uh, in the emergency rooms, not necessarily me, but people who are in crisis are being sent across the state, here and there, outside of the state. For their, if they can't, if there is no room in your hospital. So, I mean, I don't know if it falls into what is being what the topic was tonight, but those are my concerns. So, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Let me just uh, quickly mention to you that, <clears throat> and for the benefit of everyone in the room, is that the recent departments that have come online in the downtown area. Um, that were built and renovated through new market tax credits uh, do have sliding scale and there are a certain number of percentage uh, for lower income uh, folks. So that does exist. The single apartments? Yes. Is that for single people or is that for family that's, type? That's for people who qualify by income. Okay. See, uh, I don't think I fall into that category, but well, and I, I don't know I how many. I want to share with you that that is the sure. case, um, and so that it were not only uh, apartments for uh, the higher end uh, are being created. Okay, I'm yeah. just thinking. You know, downtown would be, you know, excellent. You know, not not all the apartments in the immediate downtown, but certain ones. Please. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Annie Clark. Thanks, Tom. Good evening. Good evening. Thank oh, you. Oh, hold on one second. Um, are there more seats over here? Next to the next to the mayor. Do you mind if no, please. some folks please come over and sit down? There's a, for three folks. Hi, Sandra. We'll, uh, we have two takers. We're going to auction off the last one. <laughs> Is it part of economic development? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's all right. I'm going to make a brief statement, and then I do have one question at the end. Um, this is definitely has been a missed opportunity, um, the situation we find ourselves in now. When you think about the diverse population that we have in our community and even around our surrounding area of central PA. And I, I just want us to always look in, in the two people or people put in positions, they may be the best qualified, but we don't know that because they're not put up against any type of rubric to ensure that. And then when we look at the whole system of our government that has balances, checks and balances for good reason, you don't want someone to get into a position and then use that position to change the face of our community. And that, that's our concern. And I also want to say that when we complain, and we often do, that people are not involved and not concerned in our community, and this is one of the best examples to demonstrate that people are concerned, that people are watching, we then belittle them or attack people, make those personal phone calls to people and say you shouldn't have had a voice. Yes, they should have a voice. 
And there's no one in any office that has the right to tell any resident of York that their voice doesn't matter and that they're not allowed to have their own opinion and still be part of the community. The last thing I would like to say is that I really don't see the equity in our community. And we need to stop doing the work long enough to make sure that we're doing the right work. When you look at inclusion work, it's not a word that you throw around. It's stopping at points throughout, set points, prior to the work even beginning, to stop and say, have we been inclusive? Are we including everybody? Is this a welcoming place? Do we know that we're doing the right work? My final question is, and it comes off as an attack, and yet it's not an attack, but I do believe in transparency. Um, Landon Nace was hired as a consultant, and he was paid an amount before he was hired on into this position. And I would challenge that the amount is probably extremely high. So when you take both the money for consulting and the position itself, um, I don't believe that the right thing was done by our tax dollars that we all pay in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Th th thank you, Ms. Clark. Um, let me start, I'll, I'll work my way backwards because the, the last questions were easier. Um, so I believe the amount was $50 an hour for consulting, that's, that's public knowledge. It was a contract to be no more than $13,000. Uh, it never got anywhere close to that amount. I don't know what the final amount was, um, but $50 for an economic development consultant is extremely low. It may seem high to some folks that aren't in the consulting world, but consulting, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. We are, unfortunately, right now, we are paying over $160 an hour for some folks working in our finance department because of issues with our computer systems and things like that. So, um, and I'm trying to stop that. Believe me, I'm trying to stop that. I'm not trying to pay anybody that much money. Um, but this was certainly not out of range um, and was actually well below any kind of uh, consulting cost. Um, I did, in fact. Um, I am not aware, and I would love to, I know that I, in particular, did not place any phone calls or anything, and if anybody in my administration uh, used the phone to try and tear down another person, I would sure not uh, support that, and I think that is completely inappropriate from any public official or anyone that works uh, for the government. So if you've got some kind of evidence of that, I would like, I would like to know it. Um, let's see here. The rubric for ensuring diversity. This, this is a tough one because we go through a very thorough hiring process, the same hiring process in most cases that has been in place for many, many years. And um, I'm not sure what you are asking for if you are asking for each hire to then go out to uh, community decision making because um, it's very hard to run a 350 employee city with the idea that you would uh, put every individual out. The, the rules of, uh, of a third class city are that the directors are approved by the city council and all other employees are the concern of the mayor's administration. Um, in the past, um, and I certainly, when I, when I came into office, I actually changed the rules about uh, acting directors. You may know that in the past, some acting directors were acting for well more than four years. And, um, and at that time, nobody said anything about there being a problem with acting directors. As soon as I came in, uh, I said that nobody will be an acting director for more than 12 months. If they will either show me that they are the right person or they will show me that they are not the right person. So as of right now, I have two acting directors. I have the acting business administrator, Tom Ray, and I have the acting director of economic and community development, Philip Given. And each of them have 12 months to prove to me and to prove to council that they are the right people to be approved. Um, and again, um, any suggestions on what more uh, the community would want, I would take those suggestions. I would listen to those suggestions. I don't know what exactly we could do. Um, 
I have in the last 18 months, um, unfortunately fired and fortunately hired, uh, hired people here at the city of every color, race and creed. And, uh, um, you know, that's, that's part of my job. That's part of the executive branch of the government. Um, and, and I've said before, and I will say this again, um, I need, this city needs to move forward and we need to move forward quickly because we don't have the money to pay our bills right now. And I need to hire folks and I need to hire excellent folks and in any case where there are people of color that are applying for the same jobs that have the same skills as the other people applying, I am going to give it to the person of color or the woman every time because I need diversity. You can't run a company without diversity and that's really what York City is. It's a big company. We have to have all the different input. We have to have all the different knowledge. That makes us better. But at the same time, I'm going to select the most excellent people. We need that. You need that as taxpayers. Uh, Ms. Clark, did you have any follow-up on that? No. No? Okay. Very good. Um, next we have Ms. Candace Robinson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I want to make a few statements first, please, and then I do have some questions, okay? Um, I want to make sure that, how do I say this nicely, because I'm trying to be kind. Mercy Kim Bracey has nothing to do with the situation that we're dealing with right now. As her campaign manager and as her sister, I stand before you and just want to make sure that this city, the residents, everybody, stop. Let's just stop. Her legacy, her name, everything that she has done speaks for itself. Whether you like it or not, she was an awesome mayor. She did a great job, okay? So her family, her friends, her supporters, yes, we're tired of it. We're very tired of it. All of the comments are unnecessary. Here we are right now with Michael Helfrich. That's who you voted for, those of you who did, and that's who you need to deal with. Just as kind as I can say it, in all love and respect. As a black woman, as a woman, as a mother, so much more she has carried and she has done. And we're simply not going to tolerate it anymore. So if you think you can defame her on Facebook, if you think you can say something on Instagram, if you want to put a letter in the editor, I know everybody has freedom of speech nowadays, it works both ways. I am tired of it. And normally when I really get tired of something, something changes. It's not a threat. Just want to make that plain here tonight. It has been said the issue at hand started with Bracey supporters. It's all about Bracey coming after Helfrich's supporters and Helfrich. It's about concerned citizens in the city of York that want answers and we're just tired of it. Transparency is where we're at. I'm one of the people that's out there picking up trash in the city of York. That may not matter to some people, but there's a lot of us that do things behind the scenes because we're concerned about our city. There's a lot of work being done. A lot of people are concerned. Concerned people in York City want answers. Let it be. We thank her for what she's done. We admire her for what she's done. You can't take it away. For those of you who may want to try, the legacy is what it is, and it will live on. So we're thankful for her. Let it be there. If you can't say amen, just say ouch and leave it alone, as my pastor tells me every Sunday morning. Amen? amen. My questions here today stem from 
many council meetings that I had the opportunity to attend. Me, I was here. So I heard several things for myself. If you give me the opportunity, I wanna go back and I'll get to my questions. We had Shavosky Buffalo in the position. He has been recently fired, as we all know. He was supposed to undergo training, which I question, why does he need training? Chaz Green was supposed to go through training. He was promoted, I don't know if he had training. Since then, a gentleman was brought in from Virginia. That salary was paid outsourced behind the city to afford his salary. Council wasn't made aware of that. He was here for a limited time. He got paid and everybody heard that story. If you were involved, if you were around then and knew the various things that were going on within the city. He was no longer in the position and now here we are today with Blanda Nace. So the questions we have, one, if it wasn't needed, economic development is what we heard. So we had to let Shavosky go, if that was indeed the case. He was fired. The position was taken away, deleted, no more needed. Now we have Chief Opportunity Development Offer position, which you all, we were made aware, had no idea that that was gonna be taking place. I'm not sure, I'm just following up on the meetings that I was a part of. So the question, was this position in 2019 approved in the city budget? That's the first question. Were other candidates considered for the position and how was the position announced? Was the public made aware? How many other candidates were considered? Was there a diverse panel of candidates considered for the position? These questions arise from, it has nothing to do with personally from me towards Blanda Nace. The questions arise because we had African Americans in various positions in the city. Most of them have lost their position and or quit. And now here we are with this individual. And it just seems like so many positions, you had these people, they were let go or they were scrutinized for the amount of money that they were making in the city. Many of you may remember that. At a city council meeting, only the black individual's salary was revealed and questioned and talked about to the third degree as to what they were making. We were down here, we asked why is that such a big concern for these individuals? White individual salaries were not mentioned. They're still not mentioned to this day. So it leaves room to question, is this a racial issue? Is it black, white? What's really going on? We had a gentleman that said that he applied. Rumor has it, he was interviewed. He said he never got an interview. That was his statement to the paper. So we just want to know what is going on. Transparency. We've asked for it from previous administration and previous administration. We're asking for it now. And as Annie said, and love you dearly, there is nothing wrong with transparency. In order for us to work together to have an effective York City moving forward, we need to figure out how we're going to work together. So we would like to know those concerns regarding the budget, other candidates considered a diverse slate of candidates. And then we can move on from there with probably more questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so to start with the, with the transparency, and, and I will, in hindsight, maybe I could have done something more to roll, roll this out to tell people but it didn't, because it was an internal position, it honestly didn't occur to me. Past mayors have created positions. Uh, those positions were not in the budget at the time those positions were created. It's kind of a, a common, it's been a common practice. Uh, so 
that really, really didn't occur to me. And I, I apologize for that. But I will tell you that on May the 7th, um, I did inform the council members that were present at our elected officials meeting uh, that if by the end of that day, because we had gone through a seven day hiring period, if by the end of that day I did not receive a better candidate, that I was going to make an offer to Bland and Ace. So that was on May the 7th. No hiring took place until May the, or no offer letter went out, I do not believe, until May the 20th. So there was 13 days available um, that the council knew about it, at least. Um, and again, I apologize, because it did not occur to me, because it was not a director's position, that it was something that I was going out and and kind of advertising to the public. Um, I can go through a list of other, um, of other positions that were created by former mayors and they weren't in the budget. Um, and we know, and I hope, I hope uh, Council President Nixon could confirm that um, in the budget, there are two things that you find. You find a salary line item for each department or each bureau, and you find a list of uh, prospective employees and their salaries at the end. The part that is committed and uh, the part of the budget that is committed and approved by council is the salary line item. Then that salary line item must be spent within that bureau. The mayor has the discretion to hire one more person over here instead of this person over here. Or if a position isn't filled, which is, in, which is the case within economic development, um, a position isn't filled, and that freed up a little bit of money for this other position that I thought was more valuable. So um, President Nixon, would you be willing to confirm or, or deny that? I, I do confirm that. Um, I think that uh, when I hear seven days um, looking for an employee in uh, that kind of category, I find that a bit uh, a bit short. Fair enough. Well, I had... Uh... Uh, and it, sound, it sounds to me as though the mind was made up. I remember when you, you said that uh, at that meeting, uh, I was taken aback. Okay, uh, and well, I don't think had, I don't think I was the only one. We had one other candidate, so there were eight candidates. So people did see it. Uh, it went out to the headhunters across the nation, as our advertisement does. I believe, um, Mr. Solicitor, is three days the what? What is the the practice? Do you know that? I'm not sure offhand. Okay, no. we did not. Um, our our human resources director is not uh, with us tonight, but I was told three days is the minimum, and I said, don't do three days. Let's do seven days. Let's see who we get. We got a, a qualified individual from Washington, D.C., and when we looked at the, the people next to each other, we knew that our candidate knew more people, knew more about the laws of Pennsylvania and York City, LERDA, RETAP, redevelopment rules, and we went with the person that we believed was most qualified. Um, so, so... Again, I felt that at least when it comes to council, I had provided some opportunity. There was 13 days between the time that I told council and, and I made any kind of move. And um, during that period, I did not get any kind of official question other than I will say that Ms. Ritter Dixon said, in other words, you've got your mind made up already. No. Okay, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to put words in your mouth. When you brought it to the table, I said it was BS because everything was like already in place, and I was more upset. Henry said, "Well, you were more upset than me," and I was upset because Blanda was sitting in the meeting, but he had left by the time he was sitting there, and he had left by the time that we got a chance to say something because you ran out of the, out of the room no. and then you came back in and said, oh, Judy, I know you're upset. I said, yes, I'm upset because you had already 
basically hired the man before we had a chance to say anything. Well, I, I didn't see it that way, and, and you don't discuss person, you know, there's a personnel issue that was just revealed on here, and maybe it was public notice, or I mean public information to some, but we as council members and as the mayor are not allowed to discuss the details of, of people's firing, and we're not supposed to, in front of them, discuss the details of their potential hiring. So it would but have that's been, exactly it, what you did. Yes. 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 That's exactly, exactly, what, you exactly what you did. And that's why I was so taken aback. I've hired and fired more people in my lifetime right. than you ever have. And that is right. not a practice that one does. Okay, I apologize. I remembered it differently, but okay. Um, so my point being that, that there was 13 days for any kind of official concern or anything to be brought to me, and at that time it was not. It wasn't until the day after or two days after an offer letter was put out that there was any kind of comment about anything. Um, the, the director that was mentioned earlier, um, I cannot discuss why um, that person is not with us. It's not appropriate and it could open us to lawsuits if I discuss uh, the reasons. But that position was not removed. A person was no longer in that position and then I offered that position to someone else. And that uh, person I offered it to kept it for a while and then quit. And well, I shouldn't have said that, but that, that's, that's the fact. Um, and well, I can't say anything more. You know, when you're in, when you're in an executive position, there is the potential that you are going to hire and fire people. That's all I can say. We've had, we've had one, two, three, four, wait, one, two, three, three or four directors that have quit and we have one that has been removed. That's, that's all I can say. And most of them quit because they were retiring, they were moving on to another job. Um, regarding the ecosystem coordinator, that position is not empty. Uh, that position is, it's not a city position, uh, but they work with the city. Uh, that person is getting paid and still working with the city and, and clients all around the county. And uh, so I'm not sure where the information came about getting rid of that position. So we didn't get rid of the director of economic development. We didn't get rid of the, or we didn't have the control to, but the ecosystem coordinator is still working with us, or the ecosystem builder, excuse me, ecosystem builder. Um, I already discussed adding positions. Um, positions are added by mayors, and sometimes even significant positions are added by mayors. Uh, it is past practice, and as long as the money is there in the line item for salary, that's how it's been done. Um, lost position or quit? Oh, I already mentioned that. Only one person has lost the position of, uh, of leadership. And Oh, salary concerns um, black versus white. So... I believe you are talking about all of the sal. I'm not sure. I think you were talking about all of the salary raises. I'm not sure if you're talking about all of the salary raises that I voted against all of those salary raises because um, I did not believe that the city finances could afford those raises in the long term. Uh, that was definitely not a black or white issue. If you are speaking directly to the creation of the deputy director of economic development position, I was against that because I did not believe that it was needed to create a deputy director when that person was in charge of only one individual. It just, to me, a deputy director should be somebody in charge of of groups of individuals. So I believe, um, I think, um, I don't know how many are in the Bureau of Health, probably 10 or 12 people. 
in, in there. That's a de deputy director's position. There's a deputy director of, uh, of human resources, uh, but, and a deputy director um, and uh, chief code official or, or something, um, I forget that title. But there are deputy directors, but to have a deputy director of one person didn't make sense to me. So it seemed like a reason for a large salary increase and without having the associated responsibilities, and I didn't think that was appropriate, so I voted against that, that cr creation of that position. I'd be happy to take any follow-ups if there are any. Uh, before we move forward with the follow-up, please, everyone, take out your phones now and silence them. You have a paper. Ms. Robinson, do you have any follow-up with that? Thank you. Certainly. Um, appreciate that. Ms. Uh, Sheila Glover. Everybody. Um, Hello. My name is Sheila Glover, and I have two concerns. My one concern is what I wrote on the paper up there. I work for the finance department across the hallway. Now, since like the beginning of May, I've had customers come up and ask me, why is the sewer and trash moved to the water company? I don't have no knowledge of that, because the last time I knew I was at a meeting like maybe February or March, and it's supposed to be on hold. So has something changed? We have not put forward anything yet. Well, I've been told that um, we're working. We are working on on a potential uh, proposal, but we have not we have not uh, given anything to council. We're not we're not there yet. Okay. So then this also leads to my second part, which is after this is supposed to be like hiring process. I've applied for a position down in permits twice this year. Both times you've hired somebody from outside the company. What is with the practice of hiring somebody outside the company when you don't hire somebody within the company? I work here, why can't I get first, or at least an interview for a job here, for a full-time I'm, position? I'm unaware of this and it, it's something that's through HR, so I'll have to follow up. Well, I, I mean, did ASHR. Huh? I did ASHR. Okay. I went up there when I found out, I was someplace the other week and a friend of mine said, um, did they hire anybody in that position? And I said, what position? So she's told me down there. She said, because a friend of hers has an interview in July for down there. Now, you hire somebody outside the company. I don't know what, she, what happened to her or whatever, but her, she's going upstairs. So now you have somebody you're going to be hiring again from outside. I, haven't got, I didn't get an interview for neither of the times. So I asked Helen. Well, Bill Gibbons and Chief is in charge of doing that. They're the ones, I'm just, I'm just telling oh, what Helen yeah. told me. Okay. She said, they're the ones that are Steve in charge. Steve Buffington, I wasn't sure, I, I got confused. Well, yes. Steve Buffington. She said, they're the ones in charge of doing a hiring process down here. But like I'm saying, why can't I at least, I mean, if you don't want to hire me, fine. But at least give me a chance, give me an interview. That's all I'm asking. So. And you know you can talk to me anytime. This is the first I'm hearing about it and I don't know how many times I've seen these incidents, but that's all I can say is that nobody has come, I know, especially no, since nobody's come to me with you're this trying system. to move this to the water company. I, you know, beginning of the year, whenever you do it, I won't have a job. So. Um, we, we don't believe that's true. We don't believe that's true. We need to, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're working on with council right now, including the fact that currently, how do I say this? Well, the, the money should be going through the treasurer's office not through finance. That's law. We've been doing it a little bit differently. And so we want to get it done correctly. If I'm not counsel, correct? We want to, we've been talking about this. That's right. Now so, I'll go one step further, Ms. Glover, mm -hmm. and say to you that counsel is committed to preserving the jobs that we have. Okay, but if you're committed to preserving the jobs that you have, why are they trying to move the, the sewer and finance to the water company? That's not... Be, 
Be because it has been completely ineffective, whether it's the, the computer's fault or whatever it is, it's been very, very ineffective. But what we are doing is we're bringing in the inspections that were outsourced. That's going to require administrative assistance. So there's, there's a potential we're looking at, at moving things all around without getting rid of anybody. That's what we're looking at right now. We're looking at outsourcing, at least we have a potential proposal to outsource the water or the sewer and refuse billing because it has been a miserable problem since before our administration and it a lot of it can be said that it's the computers but we haven't gotten anything like that fixed. Uh, the water company actually creates the doesn't create the bills but you know that our bills yeah. are based on the water company readings yeah, I know. so the water company sends it over here we send it back to them it's it's a lot of extra shuffle and they have the ability to do that so if we can put that one over there while the same time that we're bringing in the uh the inspections that we've been losing a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on we believe that we can keep everybody working and save a couple of hundred thousand dollars so that is what we're looking at right now. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Right, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for bringing that up. I think those are, are important facts and, and concerns that uh, all of us should take very seriously. Uh, next we have Ms. Real. I hope I pronounced that right. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, I'm just going to get to the point. I would like to know why is it that people that are renting homes have to pay for somebody else's sewer? I don't understand that. Another thing is the parks. Our children have nowhere to go. When they do go to the parks, there's nothing for them to do. No boxes for them to play, no activities, no nothing. Um, We would like to have private um, pools for our children, too, in the inner city so they can, you know, swim and have fun. You have them out there in the suburbs. Why don't we have them here for our children? Look at our streets. Our taxpayers paying for, paying for streets that are all got potholes and everything. They're tearing up their cars. Where's that money going? Um, it's just a whole bunch of... Uh, Excuse my language, but BS that's going on, and it is, it's just not right. Um, the drive-by shootings, the police, you don't see them unless things happen. And then after, you know, the situation happens, they might patrol around a couple times a day or two, then you don't see them anymore. What's going on with that? Those are my questions. Thank you. President Nixon, do you want me to respond to those that do not include economic development issues or? or? Uh, as you wish, I, I was going to say that um, my own personal experience with the condition of the streets, uh, the city is falling apart and I don't understand why. Uh, the gas company and water company has torn up streets uh, and presumably they're responsible for repaving them. I live on uh, Newberry Street, North Newberry Street. The first two blocks from Market Street uh, to uh, the railroad tracks, it's like one speed bump every five feet. And it's been that way, we're going on the third year. Pershing Avenue. Mm. They, I mean, we can go right down the list. They, they, there is absolutely, in my view, I have no understanding as to why we aren't holding these utility companies' feet to the fire and getting these things repaved once they tear them up and not waiting a year, two years, and in my case, three years. So I let the mayor go ahead and, and, and speak right. to the rest of it. Well, let's start with streets. One more question. The low income section eight, it's been on hold. It'll come back two or three weeks, then it's back on hold again. What's going on with that? The funding 
That, that's an easy one I can answer. Ask Congressman Perry. That's a, <laughs> that is a federal issue, and that, that involves the federal funding of the Section 8 program. So that one I can punt. I can't punt the rest of this stuff, but I will yeah, punt that then, one. And okay? then not only that, there you have um, <laughs> landlords that refuse to accept the Section 8 program. So how are these low-income people going to find housing? And you can't, and you can't force them to. There, there's no law that forces anybody to, that I know of uh, to right. accept that. So, um, again, those are federal issues. Those are federal housing issues. I'm not okay. fam very familiar with it. Um, I want to answer your questions, but I did forget to answer one extremely, extremely important item, and that is, um, you know, the gentleman that, that wrote the letter uh, back in March, uh, Davon White, I want to make this clear. He did not apply for the Director of Economic and Community Development position, and his letter did not say that he did. He applied for the Business Administrator position. The Business Administrator position was, we did a national search using a headhunter firm. So because this is the highest position in the city of York, the, this position controls a $108 million budget. Okay, it controls everything about the accounting and the finance of our city. And we used an outside firm that brought us a candidate. Um, by some fluke, Davon did get a letter saying he was a finalist. That was not true. We had 11 finalists and he was not one of them. And and um, his, his master's degree in another subject and his experience did not qualify him to run a $108 million city. And I've talked with him. He, the mistake that happened that we believe happened, which we haven't had confirmed yet, but the headhunter company, there were two Mr. Whites that applied for the job, Davon White and Anthony White. And by the way, when we, when we did interview for that job, there were two African Americans that made the finalists uh, for business administrator. Um, Mr. Anthony, I believe, and we haven't confirmed it yet, we've been waiting to hear, but uh, we believe that Mr. Davon White got a letter instead of Mr. Anthony White, that there was confusion there. But I can assure you that uh, out of the 11 finalists, out of, I believe, 28 candidates, uh, he, he, did not, he did not make that. And I have encouraged him to apply for other positions. Uh, he is a great young man, uh, but what was suggested there did not happen. He did not apply. And you can, read, you can go back and read his letter from May 20th, and he will, it shares with you that he applied for the business administrator position, not the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, all right, so we've got people that are renting homes have to pay for other people's sewers. I don't know what, you're going to have to bring that issue to us because um, I'm not sure what is happening there. If your landlord is, rent, is charging you for somebody else's sewer, that's, that's not right. That's not, that shouldn't be happening. Mayor, they're doing it. Please, please use the microphone. Okay, ma'am. They're doing it all over, Mayor. Can, can you please reach out to Philip directly, and we will look at that because that's the first time that I'm hearing about really? that issue. Yes, it is. Okay, the parks. We are, and and I want to thank Mayor Bracy for working with others to put together the Parks Conservancy. This is a group that has put together money to put in a foundation that is going to give about $100,000 a year for us to rebuild the parks in the city of York. Uh, we've been leveraging, uh, we've been getting our own grant money to, because they don't wanna just pay for stuff. They wanna, they're able to give out about 100,000 bucks a year. So they want us to make sure that we get other grants. Our public works folks, Chaz Green, the director, um, he has been working with our grant coordinators to apply and receive grants. We've been able to uh, get $1.1 million for a, essentially a new park along Edgar Street. 
at, around uh, between Hannah Penn and, uh, and Memorial Park there. Uh, we just received the money to redo the park at Girard Avenue. Um, we have commitments for money to redo the basketball courts and tennis courts up at Farquhar Park. Um, they, there's an effort to put in these pickleball courts that I don't even know anything about it, but uh, some people, I guess, know pickleball. And uh, then my, my next target, other than getting the parks relit in Penn Park, which is one thing I want to give, give Dave Rudolph uh, from our uh, Electric Bureau of Public Works, the cost of rewiring Penn Park was estimated at a million dollars. We're doing a pilot project right now with the help of the Parks Conservancy. We bought 10, uh, 10 solar lamps for 6,000 bucks. And if, we, if these solar lamps work, and one of them has already been tested and it's working, if these solar lamps work, we'll be able to relight the whole park for $50,000 instead of a million. So this is the kind of outside of the box, good thinking that's going on in the city government. And finally, um, Bance Park, I am, I am, that is next on my list. You know, I live at Martin Luther King Park, but Bance Park is kind of my backyard. You know, that's the, the next block down. And the grass is growing up through the crumbling basketball courts. That has just been left to completely deteriorate. And imagine that, it's also in one of our most violent and most impoverished neighborhoods. So that is our next target. That one's gonna cost us probably over $300,000 to fix that park. So it may take us a couple years to build up the funds to do that, but that's what we're doing with the parks. The swimming pools, I agree. I used to go to boys club pool. I, I know that somebody was just talking about looking at grants to get swimming pools back. I'm not promising anything. I'm not trying to make any politician promises, but I can tell you that that just came up last week of what we could do to actually get a swimming pool for everybody the way we used to have it, where everybody came in from everywhere to go to boys club pool. Um, the police, I'm gonna say, all I can really tell you is we're doing the best for the money that we have to pay police. We pay over over um, over 20 percent, well, we pay over 20 million dollars a year in police. The cost of a of a police officer with all the gear and everything, and the and the health care and everything, it's like 125 thousand dollars for per officer. So everybody's been trying desperately for years not to raise the taxes or to even reduce the taxes and the cost of everything keeps going up. So we have the amount of police officers that, we've, that we have. We have, the police chief has changed the shifts to have more people now between four o'clock and two o'clock in the morning, 4 p.m. at night to two o'clock in the morning. So we're really targeting the times when most activity happens, which has allowed us to put more police on the streets. But you're right, if I had an unlimited checkbook, I would hire more police today but I'm, I'm unable to do that. We now, we just brought in a class of 12 police officers, five of which were minorities or women. That's the highest level of underrepresented individuals or underrepresented groups that we've had in a very long time in the city of York. So we're very proud of that. Um, uh, Chief Bankert is working very hard to go out and recruit individuals and bring them to York City or keep people in York City um, to help the disparity that we have in the racial demographics of both our police department and our fire department. Um, there, are, there are state laws that impede us from getting, um, from getting uh, some of the minority candidates. Uh, it's called the civil service laws. We're working on possibly getting changes to that to give people special points for if they live in the city or if they speak Spanish. That's a very important skill when going on 40% of your city is Spanish or, or you know, or uh, Spanish is their first language. So we're working on, uh, we're working on that. Now the, the streets, here's the problem that we inherited with the streets. The, what was going on was that the utilities were coming in and paving the streets right away as soon as they did their work. 
And you know what was happening? Does anybody live near Boundary Avenue? Did anybody see Boundary Avenue implode within two months? Because nobody fixed the rest of the stuff, what's called base repair. So nobody fixed the base of the road. And this isn't the excuse for everything. I mean, we're in the middle of a five-year cycle of both utilities trenching our city. And this was approved by the state PUC. There's nothing we can do. They're replacing gas lines. They're replacing water lines. But we decided, is it better to have a fresh blacktop road that is going to be needing repaved within a year or two years. Boundary Avenue, it was two months that the thing lasted. Is it better to see that fresh blacktop and not have it last? Or is it better for us, the city of York, to work hand in hand with the water company and the gas company to make sure that all the base work is completed before we do the final paving? We believe it is. We also know that some of that stuff to get to the true base repair, you've got to put stuff in and let it settle, see what settles and see what doesn't. So we are, our opinion was and is that this short-term pain is going to be worth long-term gain because we need roads with the, with the limited amount of money we have. This is actually a gift, believe it or not, because the city of York doesn't have money to pave the roads. We've started using our liquid fuels money to pay our public works folks to, uh, to just for their salaries. We have very little money to use to pave the roads. So by doing this, we can get everything done on the base and then the water company will pay to, uh, to pave some of the roads. The gas company will pay to pave some of the roads and we'll do what we can with our little bit of money. So that's one I'm going to I'm going to take the bullet on that. If you don't like that decision, you can tell me. But I would rather sp spend, and none of it should take three years, Henry. I agree with you. Nothing should, none of this should take three years. But it takes about that, that, two That's not short-term pain. We're, well, for a t the goal is for a 10 to 15-year road instead of a two-year road where we're back to doing it again and again and again. And those are our options. We can either pave right away and then have to figure out how to pay, pave it again when the gas company isn't available to pave it. Or we can work together now and try and get roads that last 10 to 15 years. So that is a, that is a decision that we made that was on the advice of our engineers. And uh, it's interesting. It, it's on the advice of our engineers, C.S. Davidson. And uh, I agree with it. And our public works folks, Chaz Green, agrees with it. We all, we all agree. But here's the thing. C.S. Davidson, if they would want to, could make more money going back and re-engineering the roads every two years. But instead, they brought us a plan that makes sense in the long term. So that's what's going on with the streets. We are, trying, we are pushing them as hard as we can. We can have an interview with Chaz and Jeff Shu, and who are the personal contacts through to Columbia Gas. And uh, we can do that at another time, perhaps at our July meeting, if uh, council finds that appropriate. Were there any follow-ups? Please come to the microphone. Oh, is it? Okay. How you doing? My name is Brian Gooden. Uh, I've been a resident of York for about 16 years. Uh, so I heard um, it was what, a million and a half almost suggested to use for parks, right? But, um, and I'm, I'm not against parks. All right, but um, it's a disconnection with the youth between 14 and 25, and that's who doing the murders. So if they doing the murders, what money do we have for programs for people that age? I mean, parks, usually for smaller kids. I mean, let's, let's, let's connect with them too, but um, I think a lot of times the problem is we try to go back from age 40, 50, and 60 to reconnect with the 10-year-olds, helping we change things, why not 
reconnect with the 30 year olds so they can change the 20 year olds and the 20 year olds can reconnect with the 15 year olds and back down the chain. Uh, I, I never hear nothing and I never see anything like recreation centers or nothing mentioned, no kind of programs mentioned for the age group that's doing all the murderer, murdering and being killed. And that's all I had to say. Thank well, you, sir. Thanks, Brian. And I will tell you a little bit where we're trying to go with that. But first, I, I have to point out that when people give you money, you can't tell them how to spend it. So they're telling us this is what they want to give us money for is to fix these parks. That's the Parks Conservancy. Now, when it comes to other things that we're doing, we're working, we're supporting Salem, Salem Foundation, the new, the new foundation, Salem Foundation, and their work um, in the Salem Square community with the Championship Community Center. We're trying to get that rolling. We're applying for grants. I'm trying to hire a new grant coordinator very soon. And, uh, uh, but that's where we, that's the only place that we can get grant money to do those kinds of things. So we got a new community center open at uh, 451 West King. 459 West King. Uh, today I was open at, or I was at an open house at Hannah Penn where they have a small uh, community center, uh, mostly for adults and kids right now, but they have a small co community center that open, is opening up there through the Communities of Hope program. But our whole community ecosystem initiative is because we lost the money from the federal government that we used to have for a lot of the things that people remember. We lost the Princess Street Center, we lost the Jefferson Center, we lost the Pine Street Center, Rotary Cranich. We used to get over $5 million in community development money from the federal government. Now we get 1.4. So between 15 and 20 years ago, these things just all kind of disappeared. So what we're doing now is trying to work as communities to see how we can get it back, frankly, on the cheap. How can we do it without having the money because we don't have it as taxpayers and we're not getting it from the federal government. So in the community center is being donated, the space is being donated. We're trying to work together to figure out how to keep the lights on and bring programs in there. That's one opportunity. I'm also working with the school district to figure out how we can use all the K through eight schools to bring programs in from like 6.30 to 9.30. I'm working with HACC to try and figure out how we can bring uh, secondary education into those uh, element or into those K through eight schools too to bring education directly into the neighborhoods. So we're on it, but that particular demographic is the hardest thing to to attract and provide good stuff for, and and be safe about it too. You know. I mean, I understand that, but the thing is please, please use the microphone. I can understand all of that, but the thing is, um, for them to want to offer money to fix the parks, they have to know the parks are broken. So that means they are aware that the parks are broken. Somehow that's promoted. Do they know that our youth is broken? And how promoted is that? Straight up. Well, I can say that knowing the, knowing the folks, I can say yes. But the people that raised the money grew up with the parks. They grew up with the green boxes and stuff like that. And they're, they're trying to figure out how to bring that. I think you mentioned that earlier. They're trying to figure out how to bring that back. So it's when people are focused on, on something, I mean, I guess what you're asking me to do is try to talk them out of what they're focused on. No, and, I'm not asking that. Okay. I'm just saying how much light is shed on broken youth uh, uh, compared to broken parks is what I'm saying. Well, I, I agree with you, which is why if with our community development money, we are trying right now to figure out how we can take that little bit of money that we get and focus it more on youth development. So we're working on it. But the only place we're getting real money that I know of, and please, we're always looking for help, is by applying for grants. And so we're out there looking all the time, trying to find partners. We're working on a re-entry grant right now for try, to try and help the folks coming out of prison. We're working on youth grants. We're working on uh, um, 
a grant for our group violence initiative that that has money to help it people um so that's what i can tell you about that right now that's all i gotta say appreciate appreciate your thoughts sir i i, I do want to bring something up about the uh, the gas meters good evening everybody lou rivera um so I believe that these gas meters that are going up in front of our people's houses are one of the most egregious and offensive things that are happening in our community. They're destroying our streets and the sidewalks. And uh, thank you, where's Philip? Thank you, Philip. The other day I, had a, I got a private message from one of our constituents that there was a big hole in front of her street and then there was a caterpillar uh, machine parked right in front of their stairs. And it was kind of offensive that they would have left that and Philip, took care of that right away. However, when I walk the streets and I see these this, the gravel streets not being finished, the streets being destroyed, who approved that? And I would, I would love to be able to address this with Columbia Gas on July 24th and the powers that be because these questions need to be answered. It makes our community look terrible. And, and, and I don't believe that this would be allowed in, in, in well, better to do communities. Um, you walk these streets, and, and, and Mayor, um, I'm, I'm not blaming, I'm not placing the blame on any, anybody. I'm just saying that we need to do a better job when we take care of our people, and, and somebody need, should be answering for this because it just looks terrible. Well, again, I am happy with Council's consent to, to have a meeting just on that um, on our, at our July 16th meeting, or at your July 16th meeting, if you would like. Well, I can tell you one thing that... Uh, uh, another person and I looked into uh, exactly these, these gas meters that are violating the, uh, the nature of our homes in, in York, and that was ordered by the PUC. Uh, it's beyond the control of anyone in this city. Um, it, it's, it was ordered, and so there's nothing we can... Yes. Pennsylvania Utilities Commission? Yes. Yes. Okay. If, if I may follow, if I may follow up, there is one thing you can do if you have access to the hot, to the side of your house. You can get the the meters put on the side of your house if you specifically request that and have and have free access for the meter folks or whatever to get back there. So you can request that. Did you, Did you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. We definitely appreciate your support. We appreciate you coming out, and we do appreciate all of your concerns. This meeting is focused on economic and community development, so we are asking that if you do have comments about economic and community development to please address those issues. Um, we have meetings every month. Um, our next meeting is July 16th. And the mayor mentioned his upcoming meetings, but we don't want to stray from our main purpose for this evening. And if you do have public comment, there are forums back as well. Be sure to fill it out. And I'm sorry. You can ask the questions. We were just sure, asking. You can ask a question. Yes, yeah. My name is Charles Cress. I'd just like to make one small uh, statement on uh, digging up this the property from the street to the house i did a lot of landscaping and fencing and stuff in front of the house knowing that not knowing that this was all going to happen so i've been conversing with the managers the uh, the on-site uh contract supervisors they will not have to dig the trench through my yard because i said what about the torpedo uh shot oh well that uh, well, guess what? Monday, they're going to be using the torpedo shot under my fence and under all my landscape without digging up my yard. But I'm the one that brought that to their attention. I wish I had known about it. <laughs> <laughs> I filled out a form. Uh, Hi, I'm Tanya Thompson Morgan. I filled out a form, which you might have in your hand. I, I don't have you yet. Okay, I was just taking the liberty as everybody else was jumping. I, I won't belabor long. I do have just a few quick questions, if oh. I may. Okay. And this pertains to economic development? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, I do, and I do thank you for this uh, opportunity, and I am just so pleased to see 
standing room only, literally. So it shows that people are concerned about what happens in our city. And I just want to thank you, city council members, for hosting this town hall uh, meeting. And uh, as you can see, you know, there's some burning issues and desires and questions on the hearts of the constituency. And again, thank you all for showing up. So um, I do have a few questions and I won't uh, belabor the point here, uh, but I do have a few questions of Mayor Helfrey. Um, there are some things that you had stated regarding, uh, let's go back to Devon White, and that uh, it was some, something that may have been erroneous on the part of the headhunters. You don't know whether it was um, mistaken identity or in their exuberance of, hey, uh, you know, we um, thank you for applying and that type of message. Um, you had stated that uh, when I first saw you personally say that was during an interview with Sharif Hamid on the Hour of Power, which aired live on Thursday, June 20th. Um, also, I did hear something uh, to the effect that uh, it may have been a mistake due to this other person last name White. However, that was a few weeks ago um, in a meeting that was allegedly a public meeting called, but only one person showed up. Are you aware of such a public meeting, first of all? That was... I, w I was not at such a meeting. Okay. So you were unaware of the meeting? Um, yes, I found out about it afterwards. Okay, um, to my understanding, there was a public meeting that was called on the public as stated by Belanda Nace, uh, to which I was not aware of, and I don't know if anyone else in this room was invited to that meeting. However, one person did show up, and that person did share with me that, sim similar, uh, that there was someone else um, by the last name of, of White. Um, that meeting took place somewhere about the be um, shortly after uh, sometime maybe mid-May, end of May. Belanda, when did that meeting take place? Before, 9 At 9 a.m. And how was that meeting disseminated, the invitation? Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Given, how was that meeting disseminated? I Okay. Okay. So it was a private meeting, not a public, that was disseminated to the public, correct? Sure. I mean, it wasn't an advertisement. Okay. And to which you had explained similar to what Mr. Helfrick. So my question is, Headhunters has to the date has not responded to your acquisition as no, to they, how this mistake happened. Trust is that me, what we you're have saying? been emailing, we have been calling, and we will not be using so that term again. So they're unresponsive. They're unresponsive. They're unresponsive. Okay, speaking of headhunters, um, this is the, the, um, what you had used for the business administration position um, to, to Correct. get, and this is a nationwide search. Correct. Why was not such a search done for this CODO position? Because we did not see the value in the nation in the the headhunter firm, and thought that we could do just as good by and save thirty five thousand dollars. Actually, what I said was, let's try. Well, this was for the economic development position, not not the Codo position. I said, let's try and do it without it, and save the thirty five thousand dollars, and and decide what happens from there. Okay, and so uh, do you had stated to Mr. White in your conversation, which you shared, that was, uh, you know, since he put it in the paper, you know, what had occurred, you know, the gloves are off, hey, it's public knowledge now. But you had did well, share, uh, 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 if I may, I have a question in this. Um, during that interview that I'm referencing with Sharif Hamid, um, you did state that he, um, you, you said, well, you said that to run a, a million dollar corporation, I think you did a uh, company, you stated that here tonight, that you need someone that with the qualifications, that's correct. And uh, Mr. White has a degree, at least a bachelor's degree, is that correct? Um, 
Mr. Given uh, is running economic and community development. Does he have a degree? That is not actually. I don't know, Mr. But, Given. What, but you do not. Is it? No. Um, but the that is not. That is not running the hundred million dollar business. That's business administration. You're talking about apples and oranges. So. Okay. I need somebody who is experienced in running businesses. Mr. Given had run three hotels. He w he worked for a national chain for hotels. He has run multiple of his own businesses, and he has connections and communications throughout the community, as well as incredible organizing skills, which I learned with his 14 months of being my chief of staff. So I'm very comfortable with having him in the acting director's position okay. and very happy with his work. Uh, and I can appreciate that. You did say that he has great organi organizing skills. Uh, is that a requirement to run economic development, which he would be over approximately uh, 39 people? Um, yes. So what, who's going to run, who's going to do economic development? Who, who's going to be, who's right, going to be doing the economic development? Right now we have two it. individuals who are on our economic development staff, Blanda Nace and Cherie McFadden. So Belanda is doing the duties of an economic development director? No, he's doing uh, the, he is doing the duties of someone who's in charge of our economic development group, which is two people. I'm totally confused. For, for years we had, for years we had a director, actually we had an acting director who preferred to do economic development and he did a lot of economic development. Um, the duties of the position are to be in charge of managing the permits planning and zoning, the Bureau of Health, the Department of Economic Development, or the Bureau of Economic Development, whatever you want to call it, and, and the Bureau of Housing. So that is, those are the duties of that director's position. Um, according to your website, um, on the city's website, it states that our staff serves and leads uh, under economic development, um, that it is our job to negotiate redevelopment contracts for the city, redevelopment authority, own parcels, so that the redevelopment's neighborhood appropriate and the redevelopment authority or RDA has reversion right to parcel uh, should the proposed redevelopment not occur and so on and so forth. So that's no longer the case. It's the CODO that does the this, what is described as what economic development department does, but it's this position of CODO that assumes those uh, positions and the acting director is administrator, runs payroll, like does the payroll and things like no, that. The, the, hiring the acting director system. actually directs all the departments. The acting director is in charge right now of figuring out how this water company, this uh, and the uh, the um, inspection deal works together because inspections are under him. Uh, he's been working with the Bureau of Health. We're looking at uh, some potential changes there, where our where we may put our health inspectors actually in the Bureau of Health, so they don't have to do administrative work. He's doing a lot of administrative and efficiency engineering within that department. Okay, and was that the requirement of your former? economic development director was that the I, understanding I of do his not job know duty? I did not appoint that acting director you but he was under your administration correct during a, about a, a year and a half Is that uh, 14 months 14 months yes correct. he was and was that the expectation to no. only do that or that and redevelopment um, I would say no I'm this is a personnel issue, which is why I'm hesitating. That's why it's, it's just not, a job description. That's all. I expected management to perform management and direct employees. Also, on that interview um, with Mr. Hamid, um, you you stated that um, you posted the position uh, re referring to the Codo uh, position for about seven days, and you received seven about seven candidates is that correct 
during your interview with Mr. Yeah, Hamid? Yeah, eight, uh, eight candidates. Eight candidates, okay. And you said, quote, and honestly, I didn't expect for anybody to be as qualified. That is true. That, and somebody would have to come from Washington, D.C., or somewhere else, even these people wouldn't have the knowledge of York's history. So your expectation, according to your interview, that you weren't even expecting to receive any qualified candidates, is that correct? I was not expecting to receive one more qualified than the most qualified candidate that we've had since the 1980s. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the position, um, again, you chose to save the money, the $35,000, not to use the headhunters, may, uh, headhunter. Uh, may, I com may I comment on that? Yes. And that the, a key factor there, besides the fact that the headhunter has been unresponsive to us, is that we didn't end up choosing the person that the headhunter um, picked out anyhow. Um, council and the administration disagreed about that candidate. And we ended up appointing our uh, our H our deputy director of human resources up to business administration. Is having a deep knowledge, as you said, that um, no one would have a deep knowledge of York's history. Was that listed in as the job description? Not York's history, but the history of Lerda, familiarity with Lerda, Retap. Um, and the programs that we use in Pennsylvania. We have our own specific programs, which is why one of the things that I tried to do when we were looking at Director of Economic Development was to focus on Pennsylvania so that we could possibly find, and we did this with the, uh, we were hoping to get this with the business administrator too, because knowing the rules of Pennsylvania is an important and limited skill set. I would love and would prefer to have someone with expertise in these things instead of someone bringing someone in and then having to teach them all of the different rules of LERDA, RETAP, RDA, all of these things. So yes, I did think that his knowledge of those skills would benefit him and put him in position to be a great candidate. And your, and your earnest search, you do uh, wholeheartedly believe that seven days was more than ample time to launch what you were looking for. I do. Okay. I do. You had, um, in while you were council president, um, you had taken some issue with some of the raises that had set forth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, much to your dismay, you know, that did occur. Um, I do have a few questions with regards to race, uh, raises because you did state that um, it is, I'm paraphrasing, more or less what I gather is your fiduciary responsibility to run this hundred million dollar company and to do it responsibly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, during your time as mayor, um, is it true that the chief of police moved from acting to appointed, I think that's the proper term. Yes. Did that come with a raise? I don't believe so. I believe that when I'm, so let, let me point one thing out here quickly. I have, it used to be that the, the practice. I'm sorry, could, I can ask counsel, did that come with a raise to your knowledge, the, the appointment of the chief? Did I that say no. I don't, I don't know, but I think we may be straying here from the subject matter. Okay, I, I, wanted, I, want to, I, I want to show, since he did mention that this is part of his fiduciary responsibility and um, his, uh, why he, uh, where he pulled the money from to uh, hire Beland and Nace and to quantify the $88,000, give or take, that we are paying him, okay, that the city is paying him. Um, you, I want to see if, if it's really about saving the money or are we indiscriminately pulling money and giving raises? We are finding the most qualified people we can and sometimes you have to spend some money to do that. In the, in the past, this city, a prior administration and, and some 
supportive organizations chose to spend over $125,000 a year on a particular director. In this case, I chose to spend $88,000 on this position. However, I also had a strong expectation, and I believe that it is going to come to fruition, that this individual had a skill set that was going to make us sixty thousand dollars by being able to um, to uh, 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 what do I want to say manage the RAC P grant for the Northwest Triangle, which is a payment of sixty thousand dollars directly to the RDA. Now, this payment I had an expectation of in last year's budget and council and anyone that wants to look will find a line item for $60,000 coming from the RDA to the Economic Development Department. Under previous individuals in that department, it was said that that couldn't happen. I got somebody that could make it happen immediately. So now, it's not an $88,000 salary, but he just brought in $60,000. And you know what else he did is he found two studies from the Penn Street Market that I believe will end up proving that we did not need a $200,000 study that we were being told we needed before we could even apply for grants. $200,000 of city taxpayer dollars that I fought and fought and disagreed and, and people came and were angry at me because I disagreed, but I believe we will end up finding that $200,000 was saved by, by this man's effort to find these studies and determine then that we could get the grants. We won't know until we actually have the grants in hand, but I can tell you that I'm very happy with the ability of reducing costs and bringing in funds to make up for an $88,000 salary. Well, I wouldn't disagree that Belanda is very qualified. In fact, Belanda, I have nothing personal against you. But when you um, present that, um, in fact, a conversation that you had with him, and you stated this publicly on the, on the interview, that, hey, during a meeting that you, you saw, hey, you know what, I'm going to create a position. You talked to Belanda about it. He decided to drop from the race. You said, but I have to, I have to uh, 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 advertise for it and interview people. So the intent was to never find anyone else. Your intent was to hire him, and you, just as a pretext, a smokescreen, put out there for seven days. And you weren't trying to look for anyone else. And because, and, and the question was asked, were there any other people of color that, um, that across your radar, Mr. Uh, Sharif Hamid had asked that question. And you said, no, there's no, no other qualified, uh, there was no one qualified. We, I don't there was I no that. qualified African Americans and that this city needs to raise up African Americans and, uh, and engineers and things like that. Those are two different conversations. So it was what all I within said, the same. It was all within the same conversation. Well, the conversation was about an hour and a half, so a few different things did come up. Well, that but was within that same what four. What, four, what I believe five I minutes. said is minute what I, number twenty-eight on the. What video. I still do not know is if there are uh, we're African American candidates because we are not told that when we get the applications. Names and races aren't even on the applications. Well, how For did me, you know there were no qualified African Americans? I don't believe I said that. I believe I said I don't know. Because I don't know right now. You said there were none. Okay, However, I'll go back and check. If you if you I did found a, out later if you did a legitimate search. If you did a legitimate search and cast your net wide enough, you would have found them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will proceed in order of the uh, forms that have been filled out from here on. Uh, Ms. Yvette Freeland. Good evening, Council and York residents. I just have a couple questions um, myself. You've always spoken about ensuring opportunities for minorities and residents within the system to fill positions. How did you know that you got the best candidate for the positions? And when you advertise, what diverse pool did you put those in? 
Where did you, where did, where did that marketing go? Where did that headhunter go? What diverse, what, what, what diverse, where did you advertise to create a diversified pool of candidates? Did you even follow up with the headhunters and see where were they were placing that? You said it was a national search, but what cities were they placed in? Do you have an, I mean, I, really? I really don't have a very good answer I could, because it's HR. I mean, I don't handle every the operation city. of the, but the person that runs the city doesn't handle every detail of the city. So when they tell me, we're going to go with a headhunter company, and I'm like, okay, I've got to worry about these problems over here because this is a firm that has done it nationally. Now, when we advertised, we used all of the, the monster.coms and all of the professional places where people go to look for professional jobs. Was it advertised locally? Um, was it, was it, it was advertised on our website. I know that. Okay, I don't, for I don't, seven days I don't only. know. Yes, I... Honestly, and that's seven days. That include weekends or just seven seven business days or se a, a week. I believe it's seven business days, but I cannot tell you. Okay, these are things that we want to know. Transparency and honesty and integrity. That's what we're asking for. There are so many people out here who are qualified for these positions, but when you've had your mind made up, they're lost. They're lost. And I just have. I'm not going to keep you on long. You hire an individual who has resided in the city for less than one year at the date of hiring. Yet you commonly have made issues about the former administration. Nothing against Kim Bracey and nothing personal against you. But you made issues about the prior administration didn't do enough to hire lifelong residents or hire long-time residents. But yet you went outside the city to do such a thing. There's a conflict here. I'm not sure who that, who that is. I'm not sure Blaine who you're re re referencing. Blaine Denise. Oh. That's a word, yeah. I see. Mm. Right. And do you know that you truly got the best candidate for the position? I, I can't think of a better candidate. I've talked to so many people around that support this and have seen tremendous improvements in our department that I believe it is absolutely the right hire and I will stand by that. I do want to say is, uh, one, just, one other, may I say one other thing on that? When you are, when you are putting uh, together a team there is also a part of it that is that you've got to decide who you want on your team. Is that before and you that, put it out there for hiring? And that's part of interviews. I said that I, I will stand by it. I did not think that a better qualified person would apply. I. So you closed the door before people were allowed to enter is really what it was. I. I and was, is, that fair that? To, is that fair to us, the, city, the residents of the city? Was that fair to us, people who pay taxes? Was that fair to us, that you had your mind made up of someone stated previously? I, I think that sometimes as a person who is trying to make things move forward, if there is somebody that you think is good, you get your eye on them. Then you can say, Hey, is there anybody better? You know, I had my eye on somebody good and the council disagreed for business administrator. I, I'm, and they were the most qualified person that got thrown out. Um, sometimes what you say, you've got the heart and you've got the desire for this and you've got the knowledge. And so again, if, if, if this was such a horrible decision, I would, welcome people to hold it against me. I don't think people say it's a horrible decision. I just believe that people feel that it was an honest and transparent decision. Now, I, but here's, here's the th where I, I had no expectation that a, I, I, have, I have hired and fired people throughout the government in my 18 months and there has been no question about what we were doing. It didn't occur to me that hiring a person that I needed because there was a huge gap, there was nobody working for the, to do all the redevelopment authority stuff, there was nobody, and again, this, we got left flat-footed. I had no expectation that that department was going to end up without somebody in charge of it. That was a total surprise. Okay. I brought somebody in immediately saw 
what great work he was doing and said, if I can keep him, I'm going to keep him. But I know that I should go through a process to see if there's anybody else. But you had, so I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I will totally admit that I saw talent and said, if I can get him, I want him. But if, but I also have to go through a process to make sure that I don't get that that somebody better isn't out there. What and you, you may say that I should have taken 14 days or a month or whatever. And that, that is fine, that, it, that is an opinion. Again, if this decision is wrong, you can hold it against me. But I did what I did. I believe that I got an amazing, amazing person that is doing great work for the people of the city of York. Going forward, what practices you put, plan on putting in place that you don't make the same mistake twice? What practices do, are you putting in place that to ensure people of, the, of color and diversity are included in these positions? I think it is very important that I take back what you have shared with me today and talk to HR and see what avenues we are using to get the word out there. But I don't think everybody's been following the same practices that they've followed for the last 10 years. I don't think that anything has changed in that department as far as how they're reaching out because it's the same people that work there. The same, same people in charge of HR have been there for 10 years. So I assume that those folks are doing what needs done. And uh, so I think now we need to go back and have a talk. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just uh, jump in and say that uh, uh, I have no problems, uh, real problems, with Blanda Nace as a, as a person and as a project manager. Um, my, my problem in all of this has been exactly what you just brought up, and that is transparency. Um, you know, we had a, a, the, an ecosystems builder that uh, the mayor wanted to hire uh, without tax money. It was coming from private funds. And when there was some resistance from council and questioning, he circumvented council by simply having the money uh, the private money go through the economic alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had another situation where uh, the economic development department was going to basically merge with the economic alliance. There was resistance at that time uh, by council. Um, I personally had reservations. Uh, I thought it was probably a good move, but there were details that uh, I was unfamiliar with, so I, I was on the fence on that one, but there was resistance from council, and the mayor made another end run and, uh, and got his way. Excuse me? Uh, could, so, could you be more uh, clear? <clears throat> so, you know, now we have this situation where there is no active, you're not actively looking for an economic and development director. And uh, I mean, a, a permanent one. You have an acting one. You're not looking for a permanent one. You're using some of the funds to hire this CODO officer. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're getting what you want, uh, an acting director in the way of Phil Given. And again, I'm not making any judgments on capabilities of people. I'm talking about the transparency and honesty with council and with your public. And that's where the issues are. That's what it is. So, Mr. President, did you have a problem with the acting part of me filling that role? I'm, I'm lost at, at that. Because it, is that what it is, that I have an acting director of economic and community development and I'm not seeking... A new one right now. You are not seeking. A, you're not seeking a permanent one. Did you protest against uh, Shavosky Buffalo, who was acting director for four years and one month without approval of council? Did you? Yes, did you I protest did. As a matter of fact, against Kevin yes, Schreiber? Kevin Schreiber, who was mayor. acting director for 13 months without approval I met of council. With mayor Bracy. Every month. I'm just following past press practices. I'm we're not, not talking doing... about We're talking about your practices here today. Right, but I'm... when you, 
past is over. We're, we're, you're in charge of this city. It's not about what happened yesterday. It's about what's happening now and what's going forward. Right. The bottom line is we want transparency. If you've done it once, if you've done it twice, it's a lifestyle for you. It's a habit. This is what you do. We want transparency. So going forward, like Henry said, what are you going to do now? What, what's the next position that you're going to go around the corner and hire someone and, and placate the fact that you're going to interview? We just want honesty and truth. It's nothing against you. It's nothing against Blanda. We here, our city residents are here. We're concerned of how you have practiced in the past. Mayor Bracey, Charlie Robinson, Brenner, that has nothing to do with now. But nothing. But may I say it does? No, it doesn't. Because, we're yeah. not addressing. No, it doesn't. We're not addressing them. All right, we're not. We're not. Hey, hey, hey. You hey. were in city council. You were in city council. You are completely out of line, time. Ms. Thompson. But you were you're, you're, you're apologetic, but you keep time. on going. So you could have objected to it just like... I didn't need to object because but, but, I didn't find anything but, wrong with it. We're not going to have a shouting match here. Well, and, I'm not, and I'm not doing that, but it's nothing personal. Yeah. We just want honesty. We want transparency. And, and, for what, and I've been at those meetings where you brought that man in and someone else paid for it. And when you mm -hmm. wanted alcohol in his, in his budget. Yep. Right. No, I, and not only did I want it because it's a normal practice of co-working where he, he was a co-working expert that came from the Chinatown office of WeWork. It doesn't matter. He was very experienced and the people that were funding it wanted certain things. But the you, council did not want those things. But you went around so the council's back and got those things. No, I went to another organization. I said, go work for that organization and help me Thank when you, you can. Time. And that is no. the, what the ecosystem This is, this is uh, known as builder does. further non-transparency no these are uh, these are mr. facts sir if, next, if i may next is mr eli Kynard. and i would love i would love to hear what the second end run was because you didn't explain what the Tonight. second end run was mr i'm sorry canard i apologize uh good evening uh mayor Heffer. Uh, and council. Um, my name is Eli C. Kennard III. I uh, just have a question to, to address to the mayor. Uh, what is your vision for city neighborhoods under community development, and have you experienced changes in uh, appointing or hiring people to execute your plan to get there? Also, another question I have for you as well is uh, how can people take advantage of the opportunity zones in the city, and who will manage those efforts uh, for residents and businesses? Now, I have a question for uh, the council. Um, this is three-part. Um, have any other positions been created under this administration uh, or previous administration uh, that did not come before council? Also, did the council approve the people in those positions? And how would council know? Uh, do you get regular reports on staffing? Uh, and also, I just want to say, too, uh, I'm with Checkmate Entertainment, uh, the promotional uh, strategist uh, manager, and we are bringing more entertainment uh, just to build revenue uh, in the city. Uh, hopefully, everything works out. In the upcoming years, we'll have it as a two-day event, which brings hotels and things of that nature as far as lodging. Um, and again, we're actually working with uh, York, uh, with the uh, Gusa World Music, King Street Jam, and of course, our upcoming event, uh, which is the Unity Fest. Uh, I just want to say this also, is that it looks bad uh, when the elected officials are constantly at odds. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eli. Um, I would invite you uh, primarily to our July 24th meeting on uh, community development, that we can really get into depth on what we're doing. Um, Certainly, um, having the four uh, community coordinators started is huge for me. Uh, getting them out there and trying to get anybody that needs services connected with those services and bringing those services into the neighborhoods. We've got to bring people up. We can't get out of the rut that we are in. We can't get out of the violence that we are in if we are not bringing people up. So we are working on building, I, as I said before, we're working on building businesses. We've got entrepreneurship programs that we're working on. We're about to hopefully sign a contract with the Salem Foundation, and we're working with Crispus Addicts to do more entrepreneurship for young people. Um, so there's a lot that we're doing there. The opportunity zones, we have to, so that that is something that you can talk to Bland about more about how to take advantage because that's a long discussion um, opportunity zones what people do what anybody can do is they can create an opportunity fund and they can invest that money 
into um, into neighborhoods and as if you have the money you can invest money if you don't have the money you can work with us to try and get to be part of the opportunity zone prospectus that is something that we are working on with the economic alliance right now to to develop kind of a a sales portfolio to attract people here and uh, the other part which is the part that i'm really really excited about is the the prioritization of our grant applications so for us to get workforce training workforce development business loans from the department of commerce there's a lot of stuff that we can do if we take advantage of this what i need the most right now are grant writers i need grant writers to come and work with us to take advantage we have never in our history had a time when so many government entities were trying to give us money the federal government wants to give us money. We've got Tom Wolf in, in, uh, in Harrisburg. We've got people that want to help York right now who are asking us, why aren't you applying for the, for the grants? And all we can say is we don't have enough resources right now to hire enough grant writers. So we've got one, one on uh, contract right now. I'm trying to get another one. Uh, so that, that's something huge that we're doing where we could get money for the school district uh, Lincoln Lincoln Charter School is in the Opportunity Zone. The Championship Community Center is in the Opportunity Zone. There is so much we could be doing right now if we had more capacity at that level. But I also need somebody to organize the whole thing, talk with these businesses, talk with these banks, these investors, and that's why I created the position Chief Opportunity Development Officer. So people knew we were ready to take advantage of those Opportunity Zones. Next, we have Mr. Richard. There were questions posed to council in that. I'm sorry? There were questions posed to council as well. Oh, about, th there were so many questions, I guess I've forgotten what they were. Uh, Sandy? Um, I don't recall any of the, uh, in the last eight years that I served, um, I don't recall any positions that were created that uh, did not come before council, um, or th if they were created, um, they did it simply by, by order. Um, what I can say from my own personal experience over the last eight years is that there was never a transparency issue um, with the mayor that I worked with. And then to answer your other question, did council approve other people, the only positions that come to us are directors. Okay. So you can be an acting director that doesn't, according to our ordinance, it doesn't have to come to council. Okay. All right, thank you. And I think your last comment was, does it look bad? You bet it does. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Miller. Good evening. Good evening. If my voice cracks or you see me sweat, I make no excuses for it. My anxiety uh, acts up when I'm challenged to speak my truth. It's more excitement than fear, and I'm excited to share my perspective on a topic that I've witnessed or I've been a part of firsthand for the last 12 years. During that time, I've held the title of Elm Street Manager with the YWCA, the first designee in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania back in 2001. I was a part of a vertically integrated company, Three Court Inc. They utilize education, community development, and economic development to empower our city. We envisioned the King Street Corridor to be a linchpin between the Central Business District and the west side of town. Those plans involve bringing Temple University graduate program, might I add, to York, with a larger vision to build an educational center that included a partnership with a movie theater proprietor, a children's museum, and a school with additional flex space. Since that time, I've been blessed with the opportunity to acquire real estate, rehab, and reposition it in the city of York. I think I'm qualified to speak on the topic. 
The sentiments that have been expressed and attention in the room online and in the community revolves around the lack of inclusion and transparency. The decision to bypass council and handpick a publicly advertised position, whether an intentional or not, has resulted in resentment, frustration, and distrust. The decision ultimately marginalized people instead of galvanizing them, resulting in time wasted and damage control. A solution. Ensure that tonight's meeting is recorded, not just online, but in notes. Organize the ideas into bullet points. Prioritize. Put the suggestions into action steps. Disseminate to the community. Execute. Follow up. Reevaluate. And then execute until finished. The Community and Economic Development Department is the lifeblood of our city. Every aspect of urban living is affected by influence, by its influence, excuse me. Public safety, housing, business, entertainment, homelessness, poverty, education, technology, etc. With that said, it saddens me that until tonight, I have not heard any forward-thinking projects, initiatives, or referendums that will push the White Rose City into the future. Each passing day, we are learning more and more about advancements in technology and science. Smart cities are growing rapidly across the nation. So the sooner that we learn and embrace smart technology, such as the Internet of Things, the sooner we can incorporate the benefits of these advancements into our city to be recognized as a heartbeat of South Central Pennsylvania. Solution. Have staff sign up for and attend the next Urban City Conference. Bring back updates and ideas to City Council. Prioritize, implement, reassess, and execute. It would also help if each member of the administration familiarized themselves with the Rust Report, version one and two, as well as the Desmond Report. A major function of community economic development is ensuring that the city, or at least, excuse me, that the city has quality housing for its residents, or at least champion great projects that are on the horizon. With real estate selling at a rapid pace and inventory being low, it's a great time to be a seller. The problem is that the cost of, for individuals who are interested in purchasing in this market is difficult. It's almost as if they are priced out. These factors lead to gentrification. Solution. The department needs to identify financial incentives or funding sources that can help offset costs for a home buyer. Agencies like the Pennsylvania Financing Housing Agency has programs that are readily available or develop a policy that incentivizes directors, excuse me, developers and investors to develop or rehab quality affordable housing for the middle class. Again, quality affordable housing for the middle class. Excuse me. Lastly, our local economy is growing. However, what I have not seen is a vision for how the growth will benefit the community as a whole. Our downtown has gone through a real transformation when compared to 10 years ago. Thank you, sir, I appreciate that. Compared to 10 years ago, better yet, five years ago, with a vision of several benefactors and significant capital to implement the changes in York, it's bustling again. However, some parts of York can only wish for a makeover. I challenge the administration to capitalize on the momentum that is brewing in the central business district and then monetize it, redistribute the funds to benefit other projects and improve the overall quality of life in the city of York. Again, a solution, fix the mistakes from the previous application and reapply for CRIS designation or similar programs with the state or the feds. All of my solutions are low hanging fruit that are impactful and easily achievable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biller. That was uh, very well stated, well written, well delivered, and I appreciate it. Do you have any comments? Um, I just have one comment, and that is actually uh, to Representative Hill Evans. I don't think there are any CRIS um, designations available right. and at current time. So the, the action item there would be to lob our, lobby our legislature and our governor to make sure that a new set of potential CRIS designations comes out. 
Uh, I'm not sure that it was so much our CRIS application that held us back, but it was a political decision. The creator of the CRIS designation was from Lancaster, so Lancaster got one designation, and was it Erie or Bethlehem? Al no, Allentown had the, uh, they had the NIS. So was it Bethlehem or Erie got the other one? Bethlehem, Bethlehem got the other one. So they knew they couldn't do two next to each other, so, so we didn't get one. So um, that is one, and... The other item, and I hate I hate to do it because sometimes I feel like the the you know the bringer of reality, but that is the that even with the development that is happening in the downtown, the city is still not keeping up with the costs with the basic costs of running the city. Uh, we found this year, and I think a report will come out shortly that we've been behind in our um, in our pension payments. We're going to have to come up with another million, a million and a half dollars for pension payments. We also have the incredibly rising cost of health care that we're unable to keep up with. So I would like to think that all this development downtown is actually uh, supplying us with some kind of monetary benefit. But the value of the city of York, which is what the tax base is or what the tax revenue is based on, is hovering at one billion dollars. And so we're bringing in $18.75 million from taxes, and that's been staying even while the cost of running the city goes up between 5 and 7% every year. So I love the idea of trying to redistribute some kind of gains, but we're not gaining. So that is why we have been working so hard uh, with the Community Ecosystem Initiative, with these other um, economic uh, um, programs to build businesses in in the communities we are trying but we're trying to do it when we've got no money so all the incentives sound good except for the fact that that we don't have money but i do love and i took some notes on some other thing um of course we do have some funding sources for first-time home buyers uh the lancaster housing lhop what does it stand for L lancaster housing opportunity program We've got that in York that is uh, giving out, I think, five thousand, approximately $5,000 or so per homeowner that purchases it. I know it's not enough to offset the shifting housing market right now, but we do have some problem, some, pro um, some programs um, to help offset those problems. And we will look under the Pennsylvania Housing Finance for, for any kind of other. We, we have been getting the housing tax credits for some of the programs around the community. Uh, but I'm happy to look more into that and hope that I can have a copy of your comments in case I missed anything. Since we're doing community economic development, there's a charge for my comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to take care of our own communities first, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, not yet. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Carol Hill Evans. Representative Carol Hill Evans. Good evening, Council. Thank you for hosting this um, town hall. I appreciate the opportunity to come and ask some questions, not as a state rep, but as a resident of the city of York. So we've been trying, when you talk about economic development, you cannot overlook the neighborhoods, and that goes beyond the downtown area. So God bless those who have picked up the downtown area and tried to improve it. But I'm here to tell you that for however many years, we've been trying to work on a problem in our area that has seen absolutely no resolution and has, in fact, gotten worse. And so I need to know from you, is, just as um, Mr. Kennard had asked, is there a plan for our outer circle neighborhoods that when investors look at the city of York, they, just, they don't just look at the downtown? It's an issue that's come before us when I was on council that we're still, sounds like we're still trying to address um, and, and there hasn't been um, an answer or a plan. So I'm hoping that you have a plan for our outer ring neighborhoods that we can, because we, we have established neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, and as you well know, and we work very hard to try to keep our neighborhoods at a certain level. When we get no cooperation from the city administration. Um, we get little cooperation from, in terms of police. I've spoken to you about this before, so the, the surprise look 
that, yeah, we've talked about this before. So, but anyway, um, we have issues within our neighborhood and it just, it it's continues to spread. It's not being, it's not being taken care of at the root level. And so, and so I need to know from you as the mayor, what is your plan for addressing neighborhood issues? You ran on neighborhood issues. You ran on being neighborhood friendly. Um, maybe a year and a half isn't long enough, but I'm not necessarily seeing anything or hearing about any plan that you have in order to, to do anything that's going to improve our neighborhoods so that we can have economic development so that when these developers look around, they don't just look in the square, they can also look out in like my neighborhood and they can see that our, you know, we're doing what we need to do, we are organized, we have um, good people that are looking to try to keep our neighborhood at a certain level, so. So I, I believe, and thank you, and if you need to tell me again and again and again, please keep telling me because <laughs> stuff, stuff, I mean, Sometimes we can get to stuff and sometimes sometimes we can't. Like I know that I saw that truck parked out there and you're not happy about it. I know things are going on that we haven't gotten to yet and I want you to tell me again if I need if I need that. But I also want to say that every every single thing that I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting has to do with the neighborhoods. I didn't mention downtown York only a tiny corner of downtown, well, not a tiny corner, only, a, uh, only the northwest corner of the downtown is in the opportunity zones that I'm talking about. Our focus is on how we build up wealth in the, for the families that live in the neighborhood. So the opportunities and the local sourcing initiative would be focused on low income neighborhoods where we can start businesses. I don't so live in a low income neighborhood. I, I, I know I'm just you don't. saying. So what are you going to do for my neighborhood, for our neighborhoods that are similar to mine? And, and that's guess, what I'm talking about. And I guess I really need to know the specifics. We we police as best we can with the amount of police we have. I can't I can't offer any more than the chief's ability to schedule our police uh, the way that he does, and I can't pay for any more. I'm so, not asking you to pay for any more. What uh, I'm saying is well, you mentioned police, so we I have sure. police who would rather drive around the neighborhood in cars rather than to get out and walk and knock on a door and let us know that they are in our neighborhoods to meet us, to greet us, to get to know us, to listen to us, to find out what it is our concerns are, and to help us address those concerns. When they have, we had police in our neighborhood, and I have, some of my neighbors are here and can attest to it, we said that there were drugs in our neighborhood. We had a neighborhood meeting. The police came in, they was like, there's no drugs in your neighborhood because we have drug watches. If there were drugs in your neighborhood, we would know about it. Well, that they is then pulled. Response. They then pulled a sample of bags off the street and found out that in fact there were drugs in our neighborhood. Listen to have your policemen come and and listen to us. We know what's going on in our own neighborhood. We don't need anybody to tell us what we think we don't know or what they think we don't know about where we live. They need in order if you want to build economic development. You build good, solid neighborhoods. That helps with crime, it helps with opportunity, it helps with just the community feel that you say we're trying to develop here in the city of York. So I'm saying to you, one idea, because I don't like to just complain without one at least suggestion, my suggestion is have the police that you do have meet the residents that they are sworn to serve. Have them knock on the doors, have them get to know us. It can be at a neighborhood association meeting, but every neighborhood in the city doesn't have one. But where there are those available, it's an opportunity. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. All we're asking for is for our voices and our concerns to be heard, number one, and addressed, number two. So that's, that's what I needed to say about the neighborhoods. Um, you had mentioned earlier about changing some things at the state level. Yes. Okay, so I'm State Representative Carol Hill Evans, so I'll put that hat on now. Okay. So if there are things that you're trying to change at the state level, 
Um, there are processes in place and there's protocol and, you know, common courtesy. And so even as much as we've talked, if you're trying to sh change some things at the state level, it's an opportunity. I will make this invitation. Let's have that conversation because I can help. I'm willing to help. My door is always open and I've always been willing and able and available for all of the residents, but particularly for the city of York because this is where I live. So if there's anything that can be done at the state level, please reach out, let me know what that is. Have your people call my people. Actually, have your people call me. Have your people call me because I, those are the kind of conversations that are gonna get things done. Calling on, as you call him, Tom Wolf, I call him Governor Wolf, that's nice to have those connections but if it doesn't come through whoever is sitting in this seat, whoever the state rep is, it's likely to not get things done the way they can be done. So I'm just saying there's, there's a process in place. Okay. So try to use that process um, in terms of, uh, I think that, that might have been it. That might have been it. But okay. anyway, thank you. Thank you, council. I appreciate the opportunity to just voice those um, sentiments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I will certainly have the chief contact you. The chief has never turned down a meeting that I know of uh, that he was invited to. Uh, so Chief Bankert will be in touch with you very soon. And the two items that I referenced tonight are, have really just come up since we met last week. Um, and that was the, 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 I would say the demand. Multiple people mentioning the Kriz and trying to get the Kriz back in place. I had heard... Others tell me uh, about the politics in Harrisburg not supporting the Kriz, and then a couple people just advocated for it, and I was going to discuss that with you. The other item is the Civil Service Board, which uh, currently our solicitor, I believe, is examining the legality of giving po preferential points for, um, for living, I think I mentioned this earlier, for living in the city of York and also for uh, speaking Spanish. So we need to find out first if it is legal currently, because it may not even be addressed, which means we well, might when, be able when, to do when it. When you know that, you will let us know. Uh, we will let you know, and, then, and we Thank will let you. our representative know. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mr. Morgan, James Morgan, Judge Morgan. Good evening, Council. Mary Helfrig and everyone. Thank you for allowing me to come up and speak. Um, if this is a closing to what you all are doing today, I think this is a fitting way to close. And that Mayor, Her Mayor, Mayor Helfrich, you know, I have no disrespect or dislike for you, but one thing that has changed my thinking of you was you do a Monday morning video. And you had received a letter that had my wife's name on it. And in your video opening, you mentioned my wife's name. We are taxpaying citizens here in the city of York. And if that's the way you are gonna operate with that type of arrogance, ignorance, and disrespect, then I think everyone that spoke tonight should be concerned about your safety. As a result of what you did in mentioning her name, uh, everyone in here may not know, some of you may know, I know at least one person in here might know, we received hate mail. And in the 40 years that I've been in York, I embrace York, well, York embraced me as an 18-year-old from Chester, Pennsylvania, and I've spent my life here, and I've devoted my career to the safety and the development of York and the citizens. And I have never, in the 20 years that I worked in law enforcement across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, received hate mail. But after you made that comment using my wife's name, hmm. We received that hate mail. And it's not just me that I have to look out for, but I have family here, okay? And I think since we're in a public forum here and you're expressing how you feel to your constituents and those that may not like you or support you, I think this is a time that you offer up an apology. Your Monday video is open to the public and you speak your piece. I think tonight with this town meeting being open, you need to speak your piece without arrogance, ignorance, and malice. And you need to speak from the heart and offer up an apology for that. 
And I think we all deserve that, not just her, but we all deserve it. And it just hurts me to no end. I don't speak, I don't speak out. I don't come out and speak. I did speak about the, uh, the uh, services done by the company QDOT because I thought that it was a waste of money and the city's doing something about that. Um, but you poke the sleeping bear. I don't bother anybody. But when you, uh, when you bother my family, you bother me. And I think you owe us an apology. I'm waiting. Well, I guess you don't feel you owe us an apology, and all you all should take note to that. Well, I, I the next time you I, go to the polls, you take note to that. Yeah. See, because I'm a man, yeah. and if I did you wrong, or if I said something that wasn't right, I'm going to tell you. And if I say something about you, you come to me, I'm going to tell you that I said it. I'm not going to throw a rock and hide my hand. So I'm, I'm not hiding my hand. I'm going to guide you through my thought process. I'm not just going to lay out an apology without talking about what, we, what has happened between us here I, over the I, last I, month. I don't, but Mr. 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 Helfrich, I didn't ask for that. Because I asked you to correct that Freudian slip that you gave us on Monday where you literally let out what you were really thinking. No, there was, there was you had no hate Freudian, for her and was, you threw her name. There was no Freudian slip. There was, that was a publicly published article and I just repeated a name that I knew where the article had come from because everybody shared with me that that was the person requesting them to sign on. And then what the, what the video was really about was about the fact that all these comparisons between me and Charlie Robertson, something that was obviously trying to, to spin up race hatred, because why else would you be comparing me to Charlie Robertson nine times in a 200 uh, word article? That all came from Cameron Texter from no, off, no, no, and no, I no, mentioned no. the name Cameron no, Texter. I, okay, I will apologize. I will, uh, well, I will, that's, no, that's, no, no, that's, no, no, that's no. what I'm up here for, okay. and that's what I'm waiting no, for. I apologize that I... You apologize I, to who? I apologize to Tanya, to Tan Ms. Thompson Morgan, because I did not need to mention your name Thank in you. that video. It Thank was you. Cameron Texter who I was very upset with that he would stoop so low as to use political tactics when we are two years away. Well, this, the, 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 years Mr. Away. Helford, this wasn't, this, this wasn't a platform for you to slam Cameron Texter. I was here in defense of my wife well, you and my family. Well, you can say what you want and not allow me to say what I'm going to well, say. Well, once I sit down, you can say heart. it. You, you gave okay. the apology and I accept it. Thank you. And I just want to say that um, I forgave you when you said it. I was angry, but I'm built for this, okay? I already anticipated that. There are 40, 41 other signers other than myself, and I am, I am built for this. I saw it already in the vision, and I accept your apology. I don't know if it's sincere, but you were forgiven the moment that you said it. That's not a way out, but just don't do it again. Well. Thank you. I, I, I want to say that. I think enough the, has the been comments, said about well, this. I'm I going think to say enough it. has been said. Oh, come on, Sam. They. I, I, did not, I did not say one thing about the comments that Ms. Thompson Morgan made at City Council, any of the accusations or anything like that. I did not say one thing about anything that she said. It was the letter that, the letter that I was addressing. I'm, I'm open to people's questions. It was that letter and that nastiness that I was addressing. And I was addressing who it came from, which was not Ms. Thompson Morgan. Uh, we have last speaker, and that is Ms. Sandra Thompson. Uh, good evening, I am Sandra Thompson. I'm a business owner in um, the city of York. Um, and I come with some hesitation to even speak because I'm kind of prohibited from giving personal opinion as because I'm a, these things that are addressed here could come before the court if somebody chose to, as a candidate for a judge, I'm not supposed to give personal opinion, so I'm not going to give personal opinion. Um, but as an engaged community member, I'm also watching. And not only I'm watching the back and forth, but I'm also watching the people watching. And I'm watching the comments from the people who are watching. 
And what I really see is that it's having a negative effect on the community because they're losing faith in government. Um, so the perception even of a lack of transparency and a continuous speaking about a lack of transparency coupled with a lack of education on why the issues are important. Because what I hear and see in the community vernacular and in social media discussions is a concern about the lack of due process, lack of transparency, while also saying sort of a justification that the end justify the means. And so when you back it up with the end justify the means, then you have people who are observing saying, so what is the big deal? And so then you have to, why is this important? Because we need the, we talked about the young man who was up here, he was standing over there and addressed a couple of times, that we're losing these 14 to 25 years old. Yes. That's why this is important. That's why it's important for the transparency that uh, when young people got out to vote to see that their vote did matter because they're being heard, that they're being included. And then also to have an understanding of when an issue is being made an issue that they are also educated as to how is this affecting them. Now one of the things, again, I'm going to just say, I just happened to see an article today shared on social media that says black poverty is rooted in real estate exploitation. And that's also another name for real estate exploitation is economic development. So that's ultimately why all of these things of transparency um, and just, again, inclusion and due process are all important for the community. So what I also hear as a lawyer and also, you know, as aspiring to the court, precedent means a whole lot. And I've heard precedent tonight a whole lot. And so that's why, you know, again, the city council, you know, you obviously I did hear uh, President Nixon state that anytime it was addressed to him that he voiced, was vocal in opposition. But that's extremely important um, because this is actually, as a community member, this is the third time I've appeared and heard these type of conversations over about a year or two. Um, the same type of argument. What I've heard also from precedent, I heard um, no controls, and I heard no ordinances, or the ordinances are limiting. So I really think the ball is in city council's court. Because then it seems as though, if this is at least the third time that I've heard these same type of arguments, um, especially in economic, especially in hiring, um, especially about transparency in the administration, then the question is, are you considering and will you consider an ordinance to change it, to have more control, to have more control over who's even acting director or who's even, um, or have over control over people who are paid at a certain salary level so that they are like directors based on their salary? Because it seems to me if, if you don't take that action, you're just going to continually have these conversations and say, there's nothing we can do about it. So I would suggest the city council um, to look at the ordinance and see how you can make a change to assure that you have a voice and therefore the community and the electorate have more of a voice and people at certain levels. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, if, if I, I don't think that there's a question that uh, Council does not take this seriously, and we appreciate your comments. Well, I would certainly like to propose, and I will bring you an ordinance that says acting directors cannot act for more than 12 months. By that time, council and the mayor should have to decide. I'm very happy to do th to propose that, and we'll bring that to you. Um, I wanted to. I, w I I did have to lean towards our solicitor for, for a moment. Um, 
regarding precedent. Every action that has been taken regarding this entire discussion has followed ordinance or pres precedent. Am I correct? Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing in the third class city code, uh, the optional charter, that prohibits a mayor from naming an acting director. Um, and it's something that's been done not just with this administration, but with every administration that I've been able to find. So it's, and, it's nothing new. And creating, um, and creating positions? I don't believe. Um, well, the question was about excuse precedent. Me, excuse me. I, I don't believe that any of us that are sitting here in council uh, think that anything illegal has transpired. Okay. okay. Uh, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law are sometimes two different things. And I think in this case, we have two different things. So my other, my other comment uh, to Ms. Thompson's uh, uh, comments is directors, base, um, directors being based on their salaries. Um, that is kind of difficult. Um, the, the, due to unions, the salaries get pushed up pretty rapidly with longevity, and we end up having to, pa we end up having to increase our director's salaries, particularly the police chief and the fire chief, just to barely be above. And when I say barely, I mean $100,000 or $2,000 $2, $2, just to be barely above the captains and barely above the lieutenants. So I'm not seeing, and, and again, um, the director's position, the most recent salary for the acting director that was there for a while was $97,000, uh, which is, was mid pay band for the director's position. We gave the chief opportunity development officer 88 because that because of his experience that was the highest part of that pay band and as I pointed out earlier a previous director received a hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars for the director's position so I just want to question and we can open up more of a discussion but but it creates some difficulties because people are paid for their experience they're paid for their longevity and and it is going to be different. It's going to be difficult to say that anybody that makes more than ninety thousand dollars is a director. We're going to end up with thirty, forty directors. Are there any other comments from our citizens? Can I say something real quick? Yes. I would actually like to give it to you afterwards, if that's okay. <coughs> So uh, I can only speak kind of from Would our, you identify Yes, yourself? my name is John McElligot. I'm the CEO of York Exponential. Uh, we are also the group that is spearheading the Northwest Triangle. And you're a city resident? I am. I live in the avenues. Uh, so a lot of what I heard tonight, I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into, um, but I will address the gentleman's comments earlier about providing opportunities for folks here to be a part of what is coming. Um, one of the reasons we were here tonight is because we love York City and we love the community here. And uh, York Exponential is made up of people from all over the world, and you'll see some of us, we all kind of dress the same. They're master's degrees, bachelor's, PhDs in robotics, mechanical engineering, electrical, and they all came here because we saw that this community was left behind. Now, I've been here about 13 years, and I've been in technology for a very long time, and I've also traveled to communities all across the United States, and traditionally, we're the communities that get left behind by just about everything. I mean, every technology comes, it sweeps past us, and we become consumers. And so if you see what's happened with Facebook, Google, we're just numbers to them and it doesn't matter your skin color, it doesn't matter your background, they really don't care too much about you. But the advancements and some of the stuff, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotics, I won't get too deep into it, but this technology is not going to create haves and have nots, there will be haves and have nevers. And that's kind of what we're facing right now. So you know, when it was discussed that the city isn't focused on anything forward thinking or innovative, I can say from our experience, We've been working with the city and the RDA relatively closely, and this has been a log slog. It's been about four years that we've just kept plowing forward, plowing forward. And things like the Federal Opportunity Zone, Blanda coming on board with his experience in RACP, have helped accelerate things, not just at a local level, but getting the governor behind it, getting people at the White House. We had the chief technology officer come here to see York. I mean, a lot of people have been coming because they believe in the city and they believe what can happen here. Um, so all I would say is, you know, there are folks here from different places and different backgrounds that care about the city, 
And if you look around and come and talk to any one of us, we want to help and provide opportunities for everyone. And, and so we've had a good experience working with the city when it comes to innovation. I'm not going to talk about any of the other things, but I can't tell you the experience that we've had. And with city council, some of you have been through our facility and met some of our folks. We think there is an opportunity to move forward and create an incredible opportunity for everyone. Now, we're only going to tackle this one thing, but with that comes jobs and opportunities. And so uh, I would just say that while there are some challenges that we're facing here, there are a lot of amazing, really good things happening. And I, do, I don't expect the government to solve all of those problems. And so I'm really excited to see lots of folks here coming up and saying that they want to see change and they want to see forward thinking. And so I would just like to say if any of you want to talk about how we can work together or how we can help the community, we would just open that up. But, um, but thank you for your time and, and appreciate this discussion tonight. It's been incredibly critical. Thank you. Anyone else? You, you've already spoken, ma'am. Uh, can I make another comment, please? Uh, very brief. All right, I will. Does it have to do with economic development? Uh, it has to do with the residents. Uh, I'll just be very brief. So it doesn't. <laughs> Honest. Donna's, Donna's Majeski again. I just want to say that listening to technology, robotics, and everything, the essence of what people everywhere really need in this country, in this state, in this county, is human interaction. I'm talking about psychologists, psychiatrists, caring people, caring about the community, the people, the kids, the other people that, you know, not just, you know, it's nice to help and everything, but the mental health of the people, the residents, the kids, that is, is as important as robotics. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciate it. Like, may this, I remind this, folks that we do have, may I remind folks that we do have copies of uh, High Points in Economic Development and the Redevelopment Authority over here on the table. This meeting is adjourned.